Hello and welcome to the beautiful surrounds of uh, Wynn's Hotel here in the centre of Dublin. This is uh, the GTV network and this is the third in our series of interviews about the war in Ukraine. Uh, previously we've spoken to Elena Aleluyeva Lorigan, who's a Russian woman living in Ireland who's helping Ukrainian refugees and also to Debbie Deegan who's the founder of the charity to uh, Russia with Love, now known as Two Children with Love. And my third guest here today is Holin Harassim. Uh, Holin, you're very welcome to um, Coffee at Wins. Thank you, thank you for having me on. Now you are a Ukrainian woman living in Ireland. Uh, tell us a little bit about the circumstances as to how you found yourself here. Yeah, I, uh, I was fortunate enough to move here before the full-scale war started. I uh, received the scholarship to do my PhD here back in 2020. So I moved here last September, so it's been almost a year um, since I moved here. Um, and now I'm just doing my research, doing my PhD here. In UCD. At UCD. And it's important to state that you came before the war. As I think it was September last year. Yeah. So this was so now when you came there wouldn't have been a lot of Ukrainians in Ireland maybe eight to ten thousand now there's something like 50,000 coming in close to 50,000 now what do you think about that yeah that's actually um, such a strange feeling because I take bus I go somewhere and I hear Ukrainian language everywhere and I think one of the reasons is because the Irish people were so welcoming and um, Ukrainian people felt really, you know, um, they felt this warm welcome. They felt like the Irish people are very supportive of Ukrainians. And um, I felt that tremendous support too, which helped me a lot during the first um, month or two of the war, the full scale war, um, when, you know, it was unclear what is going on, if Ukraine will, will get the international military help. So, and the, the support of basically everybody in Ireland, from my friends, from my supervisor, from um, academic staff at the university, from like just strangers on the, mm. in the streets. It was amazing, it was absolutely fantastic. Now tell us where you're from the west of Ukraine. Tell us a little bit about where you're from. Yeah, I'm, I'm from Lviv. That's the yeah. uh, town um, in the western part of Ukraine, mm. as you said yeah. <laughs> correctly. So um, Lviv um, had a couple of attacks. It was attacked by uh, missiles a couple of times. Uh, fortunately, most of the time, the um, anti um, the air defense systems, they worked uh, very good. Um, there was one very bloody attack when um, a couple of people were killed, but in general, luckily, fortunately, thanks to Ukrainian military, thanks to our international uh, partners who help Ukraine, um, Lviv is relatively safe and a lot of um, people, uh, a lot of uh, people who fleed war from the no occupied mm. regions or the regions which experience mm. uh, severe shellings and missile attacks like Kharkiv, Kherson, Mykolaiv um, mm. and at the beginning of the war Kiev um, also fled uh, to Lviv and um, were staying there at the beginning of the war. Some of them uh, went back now. Um. So you were in Ireland, you were safely ensconced in Ireland when the war broke out on the 24th of February uh, 2022 this year. What was your reaction when you heard about the Russians uh, invading your country? Um, that was actually, I first, I, I kind of, you know, the, this, it was brewing for some time, as you mm. prof know perfectly. Mm. Um, and intellectually, I noticed that something is going to happen probably and something is not right uh, but you know mentally it was so hard to grasp that the full-scale war can begin um, that I think it took me a couple of hours to you mm -hmm. know to just digest that to realize that and uh, my mom called me uh, in the early morning um, to tell me the news, and uh, my first my f my first reaction was I wanted to get my siblings out of the country mm. uh, because I, I love them more than anything in the world. Um, because at that time it wasn't clear what's going to happen mm. if if it would be relatively safe 
in Lviv. So um, my first priority were my siblings mm -hmm. at that moment. Um, and my sister had to uh, leave Ukraine because she's, um, she's experiencing health issues and um, the stress, the air raid sirens, it's just not, it's, it's very detrimental to her, her health. So she had to, uh, she had to flee the country. Um, but luckily now everybody's relatively safe. Um, have you been back to uh, Ukraine since you came, uh, no. since the war started? I, I probably would go back to Ukraine, mm. but the other factors which are not real, not like not war related. Mm. Um, if I'm not going to go into detail. No, That's okay, sure. Personal, uh, no, but yeah. I, I wasn't. Um, I, I, I went to uh, to Ukraine. Yeah. Um, when uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, did you fear that Russia was going to overrun Ukraine very quickly? You know, I, I knew it's not going to be quick. Um, and, you know, for the first month um, when the war just started, everybody was burying Ukraine, just like, okay, Ukraine has 72 hours, Ukraine has a week, Ukraine has like a month. And I was like, what are you talking about? Ukraine is, a, you know, powerful country with a power, powerful army and the people who, who are willing to sta stand for their land, for their homes. Um, and I knew that Ukrainians will fight and it wouldn't be some blitzkrieg which Putin probably imagined and Russian army probably imagined. I, I don't know, I'm not their military mm. command, but uh, it looks like that's what they expected to do. So I, I knew, and probably a lot of Ukrainians too, knew that it's not going to be quick. Mm. And a lot of Ukrainians probably believed that at some point the victory would come, the victory for Ukraine, obviously. Mm. But again, nobody, you know, at this scale, even though a lot of Ukrainians had the previous exposure to the mm military conflict, the war mm. with the eastern part of Ukraine um, in Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Um, at this scale, nobody, and probably nobody in Europe in general, um, except for the um, people uh, who live in um, Balkan countries, of course, um, n nobody, you know, you can't be ready for that experience mm. because you you never experienced something like this. Mm. This is so extraordinary. And even, you know, even being a Ukrainian, um, I interviewed the civil society activist the other day, and I realized that even me, even I don't understand her experiences, her being there, her hearing the air raid, raid sirens almost every day. Even for me, it's hard to grasp. So even though I knew it wouldn't be quick and it wouldn't like, the, the war wouldn't be over in three days with Russia being victorious and everything. Of course, you know, it, it's it's not going to happen. Um, but I don't think I I I imagined the how it would reflect on the society, on me, on my family, because that's just the experience you can't you know <laughs> get rid of. Sure. Now you came to my attention when, uh, as you know, there's been quite a lot of controversy in recent days, uh, recent weeks in Ireland about um, uh, a letter that Sabina Higgins sent to the Irish Times. Now, before we st I start asking you a question, you did stress to me that what you feel about uh, the war in Ukraine is not personal against her, but there is a certain um, uh, section of Western opinion who feels that Ukraine should simply sue for peace and roll over and uh, cede some territory to, to Russia. How do you feel about that? Yeah, again, I feel like for a lot of reasons, um, um, many people, they fall into this pitfall of peace is good, war is bad. And of course, that is true. <laughs> peace is much better than war. But I'm not sure these people realize to the full extent what do the what, what do their words actually mean? Um, like giving up some of the territories for Ukrainians, what does it actually mean? So I would want to unpack this a little bit. Um, first of all, um, we have some 
previous experiences with uh, the occupation of Crimea, uh, the Crimean Peninsula, and um, the Donbass and the yeah the, the parts of Donetsk and Luhansk region exa exactly, um, and we know what is coming when Russia occupies part of your land, and this is the human rights violation on the tremendous scale. So we knew that, and I believe this is okay that people worldwide are less familiar with that, uh, because of course they're not like regional experts or something, um, but um, in Ukraine it is perfectly clear to people that, for instance, there was a concentration camp in the middle of, again, like 21st century concentration camp functioning um, in the occupied um, in occupied Donetsk um, and uh, there is um, I think the English tr translation of the book of the journalist who was imprisoned in that camp uh, camp is uh, gonna uh, be printed next year I think um, and I encourage everybody to uh, to read it I think it's called concentration camp on Paradise Street in English translation um, and he describes uh, I've read it in Ukrainian and he describes the torture and the 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 I don't know I don't even because if you when you read it you just can't kind of can't believe that this is possible right next to you you know I've been to Donetsk in, in 2012 yeah in 2012. And it was a beautiful city with, you know, with a huge new stadium with a lot of developments mm. because the... Yeah, 20, was, 20, yeah. 12, 12 year yeah, there was a, yeah. yeah. So, it, like, it, w it was just, just like any European city, a, a, a city. And then you read about this concentration camp and it's like history book coming alive, you know. You've read about all those terrible atrocities and some of them, of course, happen mm. and continue happening during our lifetimes. Uh, but still, you you kind of have this presupposition that, you know, like, yeah, I thought humanity can do better, that we are past that. Um, and the activists were kidnapped, killed, and some of the people received the sentences. And probably the most, uh, you know, most um, famous um, um, case of that was the Ukrainian film director Oleksandrov, uh, who spent, I think, t three years. Uh, I might, might be mistaken, but I think three or four years um, in Russian prison, and he went on a hunger strike there because he was imprisoned basically for nothing mm. um, made up uh, you know something made up and we have now we have a lot of evidence that this is what happens in the occupied territories we have we have a lot of evidence on what's going on in her son people are being tortured people are, people are being kidnapped and again Russia doesn't share a lot of information on what filtration camps are where they took the people from Mariupol which is mm almost non-existence to the city by this point. Um, which, again, unpacking what a filtration camp is, that's a place where mm. they try to separate people who they you know, suspect of having yes. pro-Ukrainian views, and then these people are either taken to concentration camps or just disappear. Um, the beatings, the torture in the prisons, in the precincts, in uh, in occupied Kherson are happening all the time, and I'm afraid, Ron, that the what we've seen after Bucha was liberated, um, mm. that's just a preview, and we're going to be just shocked by the scale of the atrocities we'll see once Kherson and um, parts of Donetsk and Luhansk region will be uh, liberated from the occupation. Okay, let, let me just read you. Um, uh, this is this is from a comment piece by. Um, uh, uh, this is from a comment piece by uh, a retired um, professor of Russian studies in U UCC called uh, Jeffrey Roberts, um, and he wrote in the Irish Times a few weeks back. Um, greater Russia's military successes in the Donbass, the louder the voices of those opposed to Ukraine seeking a, cease a ceasefire and negotiating a peace settlement. Yet there is emerging consensus among Western military experts that if the war continues beyond the summer, it will bog down into a prolonged conflict in which Ukraine has little or no hope of recovering its lost territories. Ukraine's defiant and heroic defense against Vladimir 
Putin's aggressive war has inflicted huge damage on Russia's armed forces, but there's no sign the Kremlin's war machine is running out of steam. Uh, because of the overwhelming superior firepower, Russia is winning a war that Ukraine cannot but lose, irrespective of the amount of Western military aid or wonder weapons it receives. He's advocating that you trade uh, land for peace. How do you feel about that? Um, you know, um, when uh, back in Ukraine, um, I was teaching at the university, um, and if one of my students handed me an essay with a phrasing like "experts agree," people say, or something like that, I would just ask them like, "What experts? Uh, mm. Where are you exactly getting your opinions from?" Um, because I don't see that consensus among the Western experts, first of all. Um, I believe that uh, Professor Roberts um, is overstating the Russian military might a little bit. And of course, Russia has more people, and of course, Russia has more guns, more ammo than Ukrainians do. Um, but first of all, I think he's underestimating the morale of Ukrainian army because Ukrainian army has something to fight for. Uh, they're defending their homes and they have the tremendous support of basically every Ukrainian because everybody has somebody in the army. Um, I've, I, I have myself have numerous friends in arms, armed forces. And what are they saying to you? Uh, um, are, they, are they determined to fight on? Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Most of them volunteered after the full-scale inv in in invasion started. So do you think that even with all the suffering that Ukrainian people have been through, civilians or whatever, they would rather f fight on than, say, give Donbass or Luhansk to Russia? Oh, yeah. Uh, there is the tremendous support for fighting until the victory would be achieved, and the polls clearly show that. And I believe, again, that Professor Roberts is a little bit um, misjudging, you know, mm. the military situation. And I don't blame him because, like, I'm, I'm no military expert myself. Yeah. And I didn't, you know, I didn't, <laughs> I wasn't able to, you know, to tell the missile from the shell <laughs> yeah. a couple of months ago. Um, good times. Um, but, um, so I don't blame him, but I feel like, um, he is a little bit misguided about how the weapon deliveries work um, and we see a lot of success from Ukrainian army since the Ukrainian army started receiving the heavy uh, Yeah, weapons. the HIMARS, the, yes, the, the, the precision guided military and it seems that, uh, that the Russian forces within the Kurzon area are now cut off so it seems that uh, it seems to me anyway that the idea that Russia is automatically going to win this war because it has more people and more weaponry, I don't think that's necessarily yeah. correct. Uh, yeah, I agree. And I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't lure myself into believing that the war will end any day now. I mean, that's not what people on the ground would be saying, but, and Ukrainian military experts too, that's not what they would be saying, but eventually, of course, because of the support of our Western partners and because of that morale, that creativity that Ukrainian army shows, I yeah. strongly believe that Ukraine would be able to achieve the victory in the war. Well, one of the things that um, uh, Sabine Higgins basically stated, isn't peace better than war? How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, of course, peace is better than war. But again, like I, I want to stress that peace, what peace means in this context is, first of all, torture, beatings, killings of the people who stayed on the occupied territories. It's not just just not the way to go. That's not something Ukrainian society mm. is ready to, you know, mm. to just accept silently. Mm. Um, both on the occupied territories and the territories which are not under the Russian occupation right now um, and probably wouldn't. Um, and second of all, I believe that this attempt to push Ukraine into negotiating peace on the terms which would be you know, convenient for Russians now, um, they also will lead to the to the further escalation rather than de-escalation because if, as we can see from the um, 
occupation of Crimea and Donbass, uh, parts of Donbass, um, which, I mean, it caused some sanctions uh, from the US, from Europe, but these sanctions were quite anemic and they mm. didn't hurt Russia mm. all that much. Um, and Russia still proceeded. And the same happened with Georgia in 2008, when peace is better than war approach basically was you know pursued and still parts of Georgian territory are occupied by Russia de facto. Um, the same approach we've seen in Syria where Russian army is taking part in active combat for years now and everybody is you know kind of pretending this is not happening which is again um, I, I feel like it's 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 a shame that Syria didn't deserve more attention and Georgia didn't deserve more attention. Mm. Um, so I believe if this approach, oh yeah, let's just turn the blind eye mm. and because peace is better than war, was not pursued earlier, we probably wouldn't have this full-scale war in Ukraine. So I have, I have no reason to suspect that if parts of Ukrainian territory mm. would be just given up to Russia to do whatever it pleases there, um, this would just automatically end the war and we wouldn't see something like that happening in like five, ten years. I don't know when it, ha when it happens, but um, I have, again, like history suggests that it will happen at some point, the, the very recent history. Do you think uh, Ukraine can win this war and what does a victory for Ukraine look like as far as you're concerned? Um, I feel the you know, the restoration of territorial integrity of Ukraine as stipulated. Does that include Crimea yes. and, and all of the Donbass and the yes, yes, absolutely, regions. as stipulated by Ukrainian constitution. Yeah. Um, I believe for most Ukrainians that would be the victory, although uh, there are, you know, th there are some debates on whether that counts as victory if Russia isn't forced to pay the reparations, for instance, so um, people kind of, uh, discuss the details, but this is the number one thing which is very important to, you know, to most Ukrainians, the, the restoration of territorial integrity of Ukraine. And you would be hoping that that message would be getting out there to those people who think that we, peace is better than war, but you're, what you're saying is that a peace that, that, that means that Russia is uh, occupying parts of Ukraine into perpetuity is not, is, is, is not what you want. Well, yeah, that's that's absolutely correct. That's yeah. absolutely true. Yeah. Essential. And how have you found uh, people, let's say, in this country in terms of their uh, support for for Ukrainian people uh, during this war? Oh, the support here was tremendous. Um, again, like I, um, I, I remember it was the third or fourth day of the war, and I went to the university to to do some administrative work and I've met a member of staff and I was in such a huge distress at that moment that I just started crying at her office mm. <laughs> and uh, she was so, so this is like one tiny story but I feel like it just exemplifies mm. the, you know, the how supportive the Irish people had been and I was so ashamed of myself because I felt like okay this is my problem I shouldn't be crying in her office and she was so supportive she was so nice to me um, she tried to help me with like administrative measures, she tried to accommodate my needs. Um, and I feel like every Ukrainian who came to Ireland feels like that. And Ukrainian Action in Ireland, the organization, actually did a survey um, to better, you know, to better understand the needs of Ukrainian refugees here in Ireland. And they had this uh, field to fill in with like, what do you mm. want to tell to the people of Ireland? What do you want mm. to tell to the Irish government? And the, the most prevailing word was gratitude. Everybody was expressing how, thanks, how thankful they are. And again, I, I, if I have to find myself with the war in my country, I wouldn't want to be in any other place than Ireland, to be honest. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Holin, for this very interesting interview. Uh, if you like, um, you can subscribe to uh, GTV Network and check out all our other interviews. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you. you.